The sermon text this morning is John chapter 10, verses 11 through 21. This is a passage in which the Lord Jesus continues to explain to those around him uh, why he is the good shepherd. And he explains this about himself to the people that were gathered there in Jerusalem because they had all just witnessed how badly a man was treated by the religious leaders of Israel. These were the bad shepherds of Israel. We learned in John chapter 9 how Jesus healed a man who was blind from birth, and rather than rejoicing with the man over his healing and over the grace that he had found by faith in the Lord Jesus, the religious leaders hardened their hearts, and they excommunicated the man who had been healed. See, this is because they were the bad shepherds of Israel. They were ungodly. They did not love the Lord, and therefore they did not love the one whom the Lord had sent, uh, namely Jesus Christ. And so in contrast to them, Jesus explains what makes him the good shepherd. We saw last week at the beginning of John chapter 10 how Jesus explains that he is the good shepherd because he came exactly as was prophesied in the scriptures. He didn't come like a thief who tries to force his way in or uh, who comes in a suspicious manner, but Jesus came in a way that was foretold, just as God had promised in the scriptures. And Jesus came to show us the way of salvation and to grant us abundant life, as had been promised in the Old Testament. And Christ, we know, continues to lead and to guide his church through under-shepherds, through the elders of each local church whom he has appointed to minister in his name. Now, our passage today... Jesus here continues to explain why he is the good shepherd, giving us even greater insights into his saving work for his sheep, uh, for his people. We see first in our text that Jesus is the good shepherd because he died in the place of his sheep. He died in the place of his sheep. We read in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 13, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now we see here that Jesus pictures himself in this text as a shepherd, and he pictures his people as the sheep that he owns and and that he cares about. And in verses 12 through 13, he contrasts the way the owner of the sheep responds to wolves and the way the hired hand would respond to the same kind of threat. Hired hand, think about like an employee, versus the owner of the sheep. Jesus says that he who is a hired hand, who is not a shepherd, he sees the wolf coming, and what he does is he leaves the sheep, and he flees. Why? In order to protect his own life. See, he runs away because he is a hired hand, and he's not concerned about the sheep. To him, the hired hand See, tending the sheep is just a job. He's just clocking in and out. He has no personal investment in the sheep. And Jesus uses this example to show that he, as the good shepherd, is very different. He is not a hired hand, but he is, in fact, the owner of the sheep. He'll say in verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Now that word know, it doesn't just mean that he has all our information, like Google does. 
but it means something much deeper. When it says that he knows his sheep, the reference is to a relationship. It's a loving and caring relationship that the Lord Jesus is referring to here. Jesus is pointing out here that the hired hand doesn't love the sheep, but Jesus loves his sheep even more than his own life. In fact, four times in this passage, Jesus says he lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. And verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life. And then verse 18, no one has taken my life away from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. See, this is because Jesus is the owner of his sheep, whom he deeply loves. And loved ones, what will the Lord Jesus do for the sheep whom he owns and whom he loves? He says very clearly, I will lay down my life for them. Now, when Jesus said this to the crowds there in Jerusalem, he was still several months away from the cross. And those who were there that day didn't fully understand what he was saying, as we see in verses 19 through 21 of our passage. But now, living on this side of the cross in history, loved ones, we know exactly what Jesus was referring to. He explains that he will give his life for the sheep, that he will give his life in their place, on their behalf. That's what for means here. It's the same idea that the Apostle Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died on our behalf. He died in our place. James Montgomery Boyce explains the vicarious nature of Jesus' death. He writes, we are sinners. As sinners, we deserve to die, both physically and spiritually. But Christ willingly died in our place, taking our punishment, so that we might be set free from sin and from its penalty in order to serve God. You might be asking, if the shepherd, in this description that Jesus gives here, if the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep in order to protect them from wolves or from whatever danger might arise, won't that leave the sheep alone in the wilderness, open to other dangers and, and threats that might come along later? Well, friends, that's the beauty of what Jesus explains here and what he accomplished through his obedient life and his death. When he died in our place, we know that he accomplished the work of our salvation by ending the reign of sin and death over us, so that though some sin remains in our life, no sin reigns over us. Though some sin remains, no sin reigns. And this is because in his death he bore all of God's wrath for his people. He defeated Satan, who is now bound and who will soon be destroyed. And so by his death, our good shepherd truly defeated the threats and the enemies to our eternal souls. And then we know that he didn't remain dead after he defeated the wolves and the threats and the dangers to our souls. When Christ defeated these enemies as our good shepherd, he was raised from the dead. And he ascended into heaven, and he now rules and reigns at the right hand of the throne of God, where he continues to care for us, to watch over us, and to guide us through his various means that he has employed. And so we have not been left alone in the wilderness. Our good shepherd, he loves us, he defeated our enemies, and he 
remains with us. You know, this is one of the key passages in Scripture in which we learn the doctrine of limited atonement. The doctrine of limited atonement, which is that the Lord Jesus died for a specific or a particular group of people. He died for his sheep. He didn't die for the sins of all people, which is uh, universalism, but he died for the sins of his people. And in doing so, he actually accomplished salvation for his sheep, for his people. You know, we might have some difficulty with that idea, perhaps especially with the term a limited atonement, because you know, it might sound like we're diminishing the power of the cross, right? The idea of uh, we're limiting, perhaps, the power of the cross by referring to limited atonement. But actually, the idea, when we properly understand it, it brings more glory to Christ, and it actually shows the true power of the cross because it reveals that by his death, Jesus actually accomplished the salvation of his people. See, he did not just make it possible for some to be saved. No, he died in the place of his sheep, and thereby he accomplished their salvation. And saving faith then involves repenting of sin and believing in Christ's atoning work, trusting that he truly accomplished the salvation for his people. The Bible says and calls us to believe in the Lord Jesus, to trust in his saving work, and we will be saved. True faith says it is enough. It is sufficient that Jesus died. And not just that he died, but that he died for me. In my place, condemned he stood. The scriptures assure us that if we believe with our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. That he died for us, that he was raised for us. For it is with our hearts that we believe and are justified and it is with our mouths that we profess our faith and are saved. So we learn, secondly, that the Good Shepherd not only died in our place, but he died according to plan. Jesus says in verses 14 through 15, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, in these verses, Jesus reveals that our union with him as our good shepherd is grounded upon the unity between the Father and the Son. Yet the reason that Jesus has his own sheep, those whom he died for, is because those are the sheep, the people who have been given to him by the Father. Jesus is referring here to the covenant of redemption. We've learned about this covenant in our series through the Gospel of John. We know that this was the eternal covenant between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in which God the Father chose a people in the Son to be redeemed. And then the Son agreed to accomplish all that was necessary for their salvation. And the Holy Spirit agreed to apply the Son's work to those chosen by the Father. This is more clearly explained in John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40, which we studied a few months ago. And in that passage, Jesus explains this covenant. Beginning at verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
See, friends, these are the sheep for whom Jesus, the good shepherd, died. He died for those who were given to him by the Father. Notice that the same language is found in our passage this morning in John chapter 10, verse 18, where Jesus speaks of the charge that he received from the Father. Now, the word a charge here refers to a command or a mandate. And in the covenant of redemption, Jesus received a charge from the Father. These were the conditions that he needed to fulfill in order to accomplish the redemption, the salvation of his people. We know that these conditions included the fact that Jesus would take on a true human nature and that he would fulfill all the requirements of salvation for his elect. He would obey God's law perfectly, and he would suffer the consequences of our sin in our place as our substitute. And in doing that, Jesus would achieve and he would secure the salvation of his elect, those whom the Father gave him. And so in his incarnation, this is exactly what Jesus did. As he says in John chapter 6, verse 38, he came down from heaven to do the will of the Father. He came down from heaven and he took on our flesh, the very same flesh that sinned against God in the garden and that we know continues to sin against him, as we see in all of humanity. Christ took on our flesh, a body that was prepared for him, and he came to do the Father's will, to render perfect obedience that was required by the Father, the charge that he had received. As Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, this was all, all part of the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, of our triune God to save a people for his glory. And so, loved ones, when we see our salvation, we must see it as not just based on Christ's atoning work, but it is the result of the eternal plan of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we can more clearly understand the wonder and and the beauty of why Christ's powerful atonement on the cross was, was limited to being efficient just for his sheep, for his people. Ryan McGraw, McGraw, he writes uh, and explains, the united work of the Trinity shows clearly why Christ died for the elect only, for his sheep only. It is not that the Father chose some and the Spirit changes some while Christ died for all. The Father saves by particular election, the Son by particular redemption, and the Spirit by particular calling. The Son will not be the broken link in the chain. God is triune. And the atonement is a unified Trinitarian act in purpose, production, and perfection. Thirdly, we learn in our passage that the good shepherd died for a multitude of people. He died for a multitude of people. We read in verse 16, the Lord Jesus says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Now, in this verse, Jesus reveals that his redemption extends not just to the people of Israel, but to Gentiles as well. He is going to draw his sheep to himself, and they are sheep from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And this is where you know, we can understand those passages in the Bible that Uh, seem to contradict the doctrine of limited atonement. Because there are some passages that, just upon first glance, seem to indicate that Jesus died for all people, uh, for everyone, uh, for the world. And while we don't have time to get into each passage and explain the details of each, we know that the common theme of those passages is the emphasis upon the fact that Christ's sheep, His people are drawn from all 
nations, not just from among the people of Israel. We know, loved ones, that there is only one mediator between God and man. And that one mediator is for Jews and Gentiles, for men and women, for people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And the Apostle Peter only fully realized this in Acts chapter 10, when he, after seeing many Gentiles come to faith, he said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know, and one of the major problems in our culture today is that people are trying to erase differences. We see how people are trying to erase the ways that God has, in fact, made us different. And our culture, instead, is trying to say that there is no difference. There's no difference between a man and a woman. Gender is, in in fact, very fluid. And race is non-existent. And yet, loved ones, we see that the Bible teaches us something very different. We learn that rather than trying to erase our differences, we must see that for Christians, the core of our unity is found in Christ. Yes, God has created us different. But as Christians, the core of our unity together is found in Christ. And so Jesus' atonement is not limited in terms of nationality or a superficial race or or gender boundaries, but it is and it extends to all peoples throughout the earth. In Revelation chapter 7, the Apostle John, he's given a heavenly vision of the church in glory, the church worshiping our Lord together, the church triumphant that we often speak of. And listen to John's description and note both how large the church is that he sees there in glory and also how varied it is. And yet all of us are united together because we are united to Christ. We are all going to be giving glory to one Lord together. We read in Revelation chapter 7, beginning of verse 9, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What a glorious vision of the church united. The church that is large and that is varied and yet united by the one Lord that we confess together. Fourthly, we learn in our passage that the Good Shepherd died willingly. We see this in verses 17 through 18. Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge have I received from my Father. What Jesus underscores here is his willingness to die in the place of his people. That he was not a victim of the oppressive Roman Empire, He was not a failed revolutionary that got caught and got sentenced to death and, you know, Roman Empire wanted to make an example of him. No, everything he did, he did willingly. He did it willingly in accordance with the charge that he had received from God the Father in the covenant of redemption. And we see his willingness throughout his ministry, don't we? That he on For example, three separate occasions explained to his disciples that he would be going to Jerusalem. And there he would be arrested and he would suffer and he would be crucified. But he would be raised on the third 
day. And though his disciples didn't understand at the moment all that he was saying after he was raised and he ascended and, and the day of Pentecost came and, and the disciples began to understand the implications of all that he had been explaining to them during his earthly ministry, they understood that by prophesying what would happen to him, he was showing that he was in full control of the situation, that he knew what would happen to him, and yet he submitted to it out of obedience to the Father. There's a passage at the end of this gospel, Gospel of John, that describes Jesus' death in the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's an excellent passage that really shows how Jesus willingly allowed himself to be arrested and subsequently crucified. We read very clearly in John chapter 18, verse 4, that Jesus knew all that would happen to him. And in fact, in that same passage, when Peter tried to stop the arresting officers from taking Jesus away, we know that Peter uh, pulled a sword and and tried to shoo them away in the way that only Peter could. Uh, Jesus said to him, Peter, put away your sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly. Jesus said, Peter, I don't need you to protect me. I could easily protect myself by speaking just a few words. Or I could ask my father, and he would send angels to protect me. In all of this, Jesus revealed his willingness to go to the cross. He was not a helpless victim. He was completely in control and willing to die for our sins, for the sins of his sheep, to lay down his life for them. He was determined to fulfill his father's will. He says in John chapter 18, verse 11, shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me? And so when we believe by faith, loved ones, that Jesus accomplished this work of redemption, then we can find assurance in knowing that we no longer need to fear God's wrath at judgment. Christ died in our place. And for the present, we can be assured that he has effectively broken the bonds of sin in our lives so that we are now dead to sin and alive to God. Though some sin remains in our lives, no sin reigns because Jesus has died in our place. And when we believe in that and trust in that, we can find that comfort that only he can give. The assurance we find in Scripture is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time of worship and for the assurance that Christ is our good shepherd who gave his life for his sheep. Help us to look to him always in faith, knowing with true assurance that in him we have all that we need for life and godliness. Lord, as we now go out into the world, let your mighty outstretched arm be our defense. Let your mercy and loving kindness in Jesus Christ be our joy. Let your life-giving Holy Spirit be our comfort and consolation. And let the true instruction of your word dwell in us richly, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.